Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out. And this video today, it's going to be a little bit different. And before we get into it, I do need to explain exactly what's going on here. Now, this is our first video that we're doing in this style, and we're very much still learning the ropes. But as with everything we do here at Today I Found Out, it's all about bringing you interesting facts in whatever way we can. And this is what we're trying to do in this video. All right, so one of the nice things about having a decent sized YouTube channel is that you often get a bunch of interesting emails from a bunch of interesting people asking you to do, well, interesting things. Now, this is the very first of these things like this that has come to fruition on this scale, and also do subscribe because we have a lot more plans like this for 2018. Now, a few months ago, back in the summer, we were contacted by a company who are on the bleeding edge of the solar panel world. Now, both David and I share a joint love of generally nerdy renewable energy stuff, so this was pretty exciting for us. Now, this company was called Rate on Solar. They've been working to create a much thinner and more efficient and also more cost-effective solar panel. And the crazy thing about all of this is that they've been making them with a particle accelerator. This particle accelerator is being provided to them by Phoenix, another company important in today's video. Well, that sounded pretty strange and interesting to me, so off I went on a very long journey all the way from here, where I live in Prague, to Madison, Wisconsin in the United States. This is Katie Rittenhouse. She's our contact person at Phoenix. This is Dr. Karupanan Sakar, a physicist at Phoenix. And this is Andrew Jakob of Rayton Solar. Hey guys, this is our main manufacturing facility. So on your left here, you'll see various stages of manufacturing. The one on the left here is for Rayton Solar. Now, Rayton's accelerator is not yet finished, but Phoenix did have one that was up and running. But perhaps because when I hear particle accelerator, I think of CERN, I was a bit surprised by something. In my mind, I imagine a particle accelerator is a big circular underground thing. But this is just top That's to what bottom. Most people imagine, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I imagine yep. this, this circle, but it doesn't need to be like that. Nope. So the ions just in the top, and they get fast enough through this little thing yep. all the way down to the bottom. Yep. It's and a whole lot more portable. I mean, I would never describe it this as portable. It is. But <laughs> well. We say it's portable all the time. We say, <laughs> we say it's compact. Relatively possible. Yeah, yeah. Now, despite its different appearance, it is still a particle accelerator. This type, well, it's known as a linear accelerator rather than a circular accelerator. This is what most people think of because of CERN and all that end of the world nonsense. You can imagine a linear accelerator as the particles, which are called ions, being shot out of a gun, while a circular particle accelerator is the particles being given lots of little boosts until they spin round and get up to speed. A linear accelerator, which is the type we're looking at today, is split into three parts. The first part is the ion-producing section, then we have the acceleration section for speeding up the ions, and then we have what is called the target section. The target section is essentially whatever we're pounding those ions into. Katie, actually explain this a bit further. So this is where we're making the things that this go into where, the first bit. Yes, yeah, so this okay. is the first bit. So there's the ion producing bit, the accelerating bit, and then the target bit. So just, just imagine like a long pipe. Yeah, no, I'm imagining right. that. And then whatever you are hitting is at the end of the pipe. Now, Andy is hitting silicon at the end of his pipe, and we'll learn more about that later, but it's not just silicon that can be a target. Phoenix also produces particle accelerators, which can be used to make neutrons, which are used for medical imaging. Okay, this is for the neutron producing um, machines that we have. Yeah. So when you have a deuterium-deuterium fusion reaction, it produces a 2.5 MeV neutron. So that's a fairly high energy neutron. What's the thickness of the concrete? Uh, I believe two and a half feet. Oh, wow. So it's these things coming together, which, Using. and then there's this radiation that's yeah. released, and that gets trapped in the concrete, yep. and that's why we're outside. That's why we're outside. Right. Yep. But when the machine's not on... Totally fine. Are we going to go inside there? We are. Yeah. Oh, Come yeah. with me. Yes. Inside, we saw a large, complicated particle accelerator. This one is used for creating medical imaging neutrons. This unit is our second generation unit, unit which was built for Shine Medical, who produces, is going to produce the molybdenum 99. The ion source is way up there, so that's what's producing the ion source. That's the thing we saw around there. That's right. the thing we saw around exactly. there. It's way up there. This is the accelerator point. So essentially what's going on is the ions are produced way up there. They're accelerated at 300 kilovolts down through here. 
the target is actually underground in a tank of um, solution. The beam bombards into the gas and all along the way, creating just a bunch of neutrons. So now you might be wondering, with all this radiation and the danger associated with that going on, why do we make these things at all? Well, molybdenum-99, or what the staff at Phoenix affectionately refer to as Molly, is a highly sought-after medical isotope. Indeed, Katie later told me that it's used in 11 million heart imaging procedures in the United States alone every year. Well, technically, it's actually technetium-99, of which Molly is the parent radioisotope. The isotope itself which is used in the imaging actually has too short of a half-life to be able to be transported to hospitals and used on time. So this isotope is in its gamma radiation and this is injected into the body of a patient who needs a scan. The patient is then put into a machine that has a special camera which is capable of photographing the gamma ray emissions from the isotopes in the body. This can then be used to image the heart to check its function. Unlike an x-ray which only provides a static image, this type of radiation imaging provides a moving image which can be useful for observing blood flow or things like bone growth. Now, as well as creating Molly 99 for imaging in medical procedures, the neutrons these particle accelerators create can be used in a very different way altogether, as they can be used to directly image munitions and other industrial items. This is what Katie actually showed me on the next part of our tour. So this is our latest unit, and this one is designed for actually um, something called neutron radiography. That's where we're actually, uh, it works very much like an x-ray. So we yeah. have a thing we want to image, we shoot neutrons at it, it hits the thing, it interacts with it, and then we have a um, detector plate and film, again, very much like an x-ray behind it, and then we're able to get an image. So that ion source is in here. This was the thing that was on top previously. Right, on top. So this is the accelerator right here. Yeah. And there's magnets to focus the beam. And then the beam will actually come through here. And so this is the target that we talked about, the third bit. Um, this one is used for imaging. The detector plate goes here, and then the film. We run it for a certain amount of time. It takes a lot longer to do a neutron image than it does an x-ray image. Now this bit can produce some really amazing results, and it has several industrial applications. Specifically, it can be used to look inside munitions to see if they're defective. This is something impossible to do with x-rays, but with neutron imaging, you can actually look inside a bullet. Have a look at this image of a bullet that was imaged in this way. The second bullet from the left here is without gunpowder, and defective munitions, there are danger on the battlefield, but this sort of checking prevents problems. Now compare that to this x-ray image of the same bullets and you can see that they all look the same and we can't tell which one has gunpowder inside it. Now while this machine is totally different to what Andy's going to be using it for, which is creating solar panels, we've got more on that in a minute, it's actually a remarkably similar process. So we basically have ion source, acceleration chamber, silicon, and then the protons come this way through the acceleration column here. Yeah. All right. And then We'll have a vacuum chamber right here with silicon in it. Protons hit the silicon and you can take that out of the vacuum chamber. So remember how we were talking about that big concrete wall and all the radiation that's being produced? Well, we still wanted to have a look at the beam actually working. We can't actually go in the bunker to look at the beam. So we're going to go up into the mezzanine, where the, that glass area we could overlook. And then on the computer screens, um, we actually have a camera rigged up in the bunker that's looking into where the beam is showing. So cool. we'll be able to see that. OK, What's up? Now we've heard a lot about the uses of this accelerator technology, but what we're really interested in is how this can be applied to something rather different, the manufacture of solar panels. Well, I sat down to talk to Andrew Jakob about this. Andy's final machine is actually being built, so we can't actually show you the completed machine itself. Andy told me all about how this process works. What Raytown Solar has done is taken the Phoenix uh, technology, that's the core technology that kind of drives what we're doing, right? So what we plan to do and what we have been working on is developing the world's most cost-efficient source of renewable energy uh, with solar panels. Uh, by reducing the cost of the solar panel and using uh, material that is more expensive, uh, it yields a higher efficiency solar cell. Uh, this picture is what we've developed uh, to date, right? So it's a sample cell. Um, you can see the glass, right? We're using glass as a substrate, right? Uh, and then you have that gray material there, that's the metal. So you have metal on glass, and then the black part is silicon exfoliated onto that. It's a 1.7 micron thick layer of silicon. How big is a micron? So the human hair 
a human hair is about 10 to 100 microns. Oh, it's really it's small. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's so really it's thin. Tenth of the smallest human hair. Just to give you an idea of how small that is, let's say that this is 50 microns. That's a human hair. This is Raton's silicon thickness at 1.7 microns. But more importantly, this is the thickness of silicon in a standard solar panel. Andy explained to me why this is the case. The conventional way to get wafers is you have this big bool, and that big bool is pure silicon, right? And it, it, it's grown that way as a single crystal of silicon, and you need to, it takes about a month to grow a bool. So amorphous silicon isn't very good at collecting sunlight. You have to get it in a crystal structure, a perfect crystal structure, and then it becomes more efficient. Okay. So amorphous silicon is like 5% efficient. So this is electronic grade silicon. So right now the whole solar industry doesn't even use that quality of silicon. It's expensive to do that. So anyway, so you took all this time, you spent all this energy to make your silicon ingot, and then what they do is they cut it up. <laughs> they cut out wafers from the silicon ingot, and when you do that, you waste half of the raw material. The saw blade itself is 200 microns thick. So when you cut out a wafer, you lose a wafer. And in the semiconductor industry, you don't really care because you have a little, tiny little microchip that big that you can sell for 800 bucks. In the solar industry, we're covering millions of square acres of land yeah. in that material. With the ion implanter, right, we can, we, can take the, we can take a chunk of the ingot itself, yeah. implant it, and then peel off a three micron layer. What do you mean by implanting? So implanting, um, basically is when you let the protons hit the silicon. Okay. Right, and so it'll penetrate a certain depth. And that essentially separates it from the remainder of the silicon. Right, so you, you get a layer, if you have a dense enough layer of those protons, yeah. right, they'll, they'll create a micro crack. So your protons are shot into this thing. They're shot They into stay the at three microns into it yeah. and create a crack in it. Right. And that causes it to Flake off. That, yeah, that's right. not a technical term. No, yeah, it's... you can flake it off. You can, I mean, yeah. you can literally just remove that layer. Our, our goal here is to create this product, and we're estimating we can manufacture these high efficiency solar cells at 20, 22.7 cents a watt, and they'd be 24% efficient. Right? So it's 52% cheaper than the industry best, and it's 14% higher than the industry best. And with normal solar powers, they're using the non-high quality stuff. Right. But, the but because you're getting so much more out of the high quality stuff, mm -hmm. it still is cheaper because you're just right. getting more. It's still cheaper. More slices. Right. Right? Right. Cool. It's 10 times the cost, but we're using 100 times less material. Right. And where Phoenix ties into all of this is that they make the machine that shoots those protons into the silicon and allows Andy to flake off his very thin slices of silicon. Right now, Phoenix are making the first machine for Andy for a pilot run, and this will be able to produce enough solar panels for hundreds of homes every year. And if all goes to plan, more machines like this can be built, making more efficient solar panels, not just including using higher quality silicon cells that others use, but potentially the more efficient gallium arsenide cells, which can be made with this process, along with more efficient multi-junction solar cells, which all means more efficient solar cells, powering a whole lot of homes. Andy then let me have a look at the silicon that they're going to be using in its pre-cut state. And then Andy let us have a look at a small sample that they'd made using a much less powerful particle accelerator. One way for 760 and then there's three right. micrometers three of micro, yeah. silicon. So we're right. talking... So we can get like 200 wafers out of one of those wafers. Right. <laughs> that's a really interesting perspective thing. If that's right. seven, 760 60 versus three. Yeah. So yeah, that's really thin. So if we took our standard solar panel, let's say the size of an A4 page, and we produced it the way Rayton Solar makes them, our same solar panel could be 114 square feet. That's 176 A4 pages. Oh, is this the, the actual? This is the one, yeah, this is the actual one in the picture. You can, you can, hold can I touch that? Yeah, you can, you can. How about that? So I really hope you enjoyed that special video. Now we want to do more stuff like this in the future, looking at cool new tech and how stuff is made and things of this nature to give you a behind the scenes look in an educational way at stuff that most people don't have access to, which we here at Today I Found Out think is super interesting. So do let us know what you think of this idea and format in the comments below. I'd also like to personally thank Rayton Solar, particularly Andrew Jacob and Phoenix, particularly Katie Rittenhouse for bringing us out to them and bringing this video to you. If you're like to learn more about either of these companies, please check out the links in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.